I'm, I'm ready to start. Okay. Wait. Just let me know when you're starting to record. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to the Mozilla London office. Uh, my name is John Lloyd, I'm the head of uh, European campaigns here at the Mozilla Foundation. Um, the foundation's theme this year is your data and you, and we've been exploring all the ways that data is collected about us, uh, where it's stored and how it's uh, used and shared. Since Cambridge Analytica, there's been a marked increase in concern from the public about the way that the data is being collected and how it shapes the world. So we've been seeking out conversations to our theme of your data and you and um, looking for different and unique points of view. So that's why I'm absolutely delighted that we're able to invite uh, Yvonne Rogers. Um, she works as professor and director of University College London's Interaction Centre. Um, Yvonne's work resonated with us in particular um, because her approach is centred around the experiences of regular people. So uh, today she'll be speaking about a more open approach to data collection and use, um, an approach that enables everyday people to be more aware of, understand, accept and act upon data collected about them. Um, after Yvonne's finished speaking, we're going to have a brief Q&A. Um, so get your questions in on Twitter, uh, that's hashtag Mozilla Speakers. And on the Slack channel, um, that's hashtag speaker dash series. Uh, and we'll also take questions here in London and the other offices. So um, please welcome me and join Yvonne. Thank you very much, John. It's a great pleasure to be in Mozilla London. Earlier in the year, I was in Mozilla Mountain View, so I'm just ticking them off. I'll be off to Berlin and uh, the other ones, which I know there are far too many to mention. Anyway, so um, my talk today is going to be, uh, as you can see from the title, in two halves. The first half is going to be talking about creepy data and what that is and why everyone suddenly got interested in it. And then the second part is going to be talking about my own research, which is let's not just let this uh, take over the debate, but let's think about how we can make data open and accessible and to make people curious about that data and want to know more and ultimately empower them. Um, every week there are stories about creepy data or creepy technology in the news. And I'm sure you've seen many of these. These are the ones I just took off from the last two or three weeks. The first one is Spotify and Tinder need to stop being creepy with customer data. And this is not just them, but also Netflix. And it's saying that they've been revealing personal details of customers in an attempt to uh, create viral marketing campaigns. And the one in particular that they refer to was last year, uh, Netflix publicly announced that 53 people had watched the film A Christmas Prince for 18 days in a row. Now, that, is that just making fun of someone? Why are they doing that? Have they got such a boring life? Um, but anyway, this, this got to the attention of the, of the news, and they think that's creepy. Then last week, um, Facebook's announcement of its new um, portal uh, video conferencing system that's going to come out soon, that got a lot of attention in the media, saying Facebook's creepy new speakers are freaking people out. And I'll talk a bit more about this, but the... Uh, the, the opinion of, of these reporters is that because these have got cameras in them as well as microphones, they can secretly record what people are doing in their homes and then use that. And then this last one was from a week ago. I'm sure some of you have seen this, which was about Netflix is deceiving black users with creepy posters. And as you know, uh, Netflix likes to customize uh, what you might want to view next based on what you've viewed, viewed before. And uh, for some of their black viewers, um, they were uh, noticing that they like to watch films with black actors in, and so they were suggesting these films um, or movies, uh, except these weren't uh, main actors, they were, um, you know, only um, uh, bit part actors, and, it, and this was felt to be creepy, they were deceiving the, the viewers. So there's lots of these um, appearing each week, um, and, the, and the media is really interested in this notion of creepiness. But are, in what way are they creepy? And I guess the, the bottom line is that it makes people feel uncomfortable and then that they're unaware that their digital habits, what they're watching, what they're touching and clicking and so on, are being collected, uh, being collated, being compared or even being sold to third parties. 
And as a result of this, they can personalize uh, new content or ads to you. They can target um, propaganda or fake news. And in the Netflix case, they can just simply make fun of you. Um, but what happens if users were more, um, if they knew more about the process? Would they mind as much? So how many of you here have a loyalty card to Waitrose or Tesco's um, so that you get, um, and you're, you're comfortable with that? Yes, because you get free coffee, you get uh, discounts, you get vouchers. A lot of people know what the loyalty card is about. It helps them to do their marketing and their um, analysis. So what, what, if users knew about the processes that the Netflix and these other companies are using, uh, would they find it less disturbing? Would they be more accepting? And I think this is the question we need to ask. Um, another thing is do, you know, this is very much coming from a media uh, perspective, but do the general public themselves mind their personal data being collected? So I've just had a hand, uh, I, you know, getting you to show your hands and then shake your heads. There was a study done last year by YouGov in the UK, and they found seven in ten consumers don't mind sharing their data if they get something back. And that something could be saving money, it could be a bargain, or improve customer service. And that's quite a high figure, um, so long as you know you get something back um, if you give something. But on the other hand, we know that as people learn more about what these companies are getting up to, uh, and it, they feel it's an invasion of their digital privacy, and some will go and, you know, will take action to stop it. Um, and we've seen an increase in uh, people, particularly young people, quitting social media. For example, Facebook. How many of you have quit Facebook? Um, quite a few of you here have put your hands up. How many of you cover up your laptop cameras with plasters? <laughs> Nearly over half of you. How many of you have removed your stored bank details from online sites like Amazon as a result of all the breaches? A number of you. So I think you're probably, you know, um, in the audience, well aware of the measures you can take to prevent these things from happening. So you can see, you know, that some people don't mind and others will take precautionary measures. And I think it's not just a clear-cut matter as to whether it's one thing, black or white, but there are many shades um, to viewing personal data collection and its use. And I think sometimes it can be beneficial to society to learn about the health of a nation and economic trends by collecting data. Um, you know, and this is what's been done with the census for hundreds of years. I think sometimes targeting advertising is what people want. They want to have that advert that shows them a pair of slippers that they, they've always wanted at Christmas or um, you know, particular kinds of um, uh, goods. And it can work well. But sometimes, as I've just said, people don't mind giving up their data if they get something back. But sometimes it's downright evil or insidious to collect it. And it just depends on uh, the, the user group and the context. But what I also want to mention is that I think sometimes it can raise new ethical issues for us as society and researchers to start thinking about, which we didn't have to think about before. And this is one, I think, which um, appeared last year, which um, is, uh, the headline here is, New Technology is Forcing Us to Confront the Ethics of Bringing People Back from the Dead. I don't know how many of you saw this, but uh, Eugenia Kuja, um, one of her close friends died in a car accident, and he was only in his 20s, and she was, you know, devastated, and, and, and it really cut her up. And she was an AI expert, and she didn't want to lose the memory of her friend, Roman. And so what she did was she gathered all the texts that Roman had written um, and combined those together to make a chatbot. And this allowed her to then communicate with her dead friend as if he was alive. So she could type in, I miss you, and that dead person would say, I miss you too. And so have a conversation as if with that person. So here is um, an example, if you can see it, with Roman. And he says, what do you want to know? What are you working on? That's the, uh, the real person who's alive. Um, and Roman's saying, working on disrupting death and Stampy at the same time, I'll go get an internship at a funeral house for my research, and so on. So this chatbot is expressing Roman's personality, his poetic perspective, and also his self-deprecating sense of humor. <clears throat> is this creepy, or is it something that just seems okay? And I think it's very comforting for the grieving friend to have the chat. Uh, it makes her you know, feel closer to Roman. But we have to remember that Roman didn't give permission for his data his, his text to be used in this way. 
And when I was talking to one of my colleagues about this, she, she was immediately repulsed. And she said, it's dis disrespectful of the dead and some communities and their, their, you know, what they think of the dead. But then I said, well, how different is it from looking at all the photos and the videos that you might have collected from that person? Um, you're, you know, you're wanting to remember that person and connect with them. And, um, you know, what if Roman had actually agreed to having his text mashed up in this way in a pre-death digital agreement? So I think here is, a, here is an example where we didn't have this before. I think it is different from looking at photos or videos because it's, you're, you don't know, you know what's there. You, you're not asking questions and pretending it's someone. Um, but is it, is it creepy? And if so, for what, for what reasons? Um, I want to move on now to think about another field, a new field that's emerging and how that raises new issues for us to think about, which is the field of emotional AI. And emotional AI is using machine learning techniques to recognize people's face and detect their emotions. So it'll take uh, shots of your face, it'll use some sophisticated 2D, 3D modeling, and then it will say whether or not you're angry or sad, and it can also recognize who you are. Originally, this technology um, was uh, developed for store, uh, for, um, to be used in, 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 in stores um, to uh, match up with known shoplifters. And so the cameras would be placed uh, around and they would take pictures of people in the store and convert it into these biometric templates. But once these are in place, these cameras, they can also be used to measure um, in-store dwell times, and by that I mean the, the amount of time that you're looking at that can of Dr. Pepper or looking at you, um, and also the responses. So if I'm looking at that and I might be salivating because I might be really thirsty or looking at that food, they can then measure my interest in that. Uh, whereas over here, I might not be looking at that at all. Um, and so this can be used for marketing purposes. But also, machine learning can classify the lookers in milliseconds. So it could classify me by my gender, by my age, and my assumed emotional state. Am I nervous? Am I anxious? Am I really hungry? And so on. And so the question here, I think, for us to consider is, um, retailers have argued that this kind of data analysis has been happening in online shopping. They've been looking at how long people um, you know, click, whether they stay, and so on, for many years. So they already have good models of online shoppers. So is this any different for physical um, shopping, where you go in, you've got cameras there. Why is that different? Is Because it's getting them the same information. And I think it is different. And the reason is it's getting under your skin in ways in which online isn't. So imagine yourself as a shopper. Would you be comfortable with this kind of face tracking, getting the biometrics, if you knew it was happening? If you knew that these cameras around here we're just looking, we're looking at you and detecting uh, different changes in, in your facial expression and being able to decide whether you're interested or not. It's not just in stores that this has been used, but it's now being used by companies uh, for job interviewees. So imagine you're going for a, a job interview at Mozilla. And uh, that Mozilla have just heard about this amazing new um, technology, which can detect, um, you know, can help get the right person. So um, a startup company called Human, which is based in London, uh, claims to be able to detect subliminal facial expressions. By that is meant those that you cannot detect yourself in others. So um, looking at you, I can see that you're very interested. But if I had this, this technology, it might be able to tell me much more about what's going on and what you're thinking about. And it can calculate uh, scores for how honest you are, for example, how nervous you are, how passionate you are, um, and in particular to answering questions. So, you know, if I'm asked a question like, um, tell me about a difficult time you, you had at work and how you dealt with it, it could see how I responded to that. So... In this case, Human is just providing a service. It will do this profiling. It will capture data. Um, so it will have cameras in the interview room. And um, it can do the analysis. And then it will compile a report. The hiring company, like Mozilla, will just um, pay for this service. And they will use the results from this uh, uh, 
this type of analysis with other HR data. So no one needs to be responsible for the ethics behind this, whether it is ethical. So the moral question here um, is recruiting companies already profile applicants from their tweets, their blogs and posts. Um, so how is facial profiling any different? Um, they want to get the best person or they want to get the person that matches the job uh, description. Well, I, I will put this to you to think about, which is if you were an interviewee, would you be comfortable if you knew that your every smile, your every twitch, your every laugh was being analysed as you sat there in the interview in a stressful situation? Um, uh, maybe you wouldn't mind. Maybe you could learn how to, to make your face uh, appear that you're very interested and passionate so you could be ahead of the game. Uh, but it's still very much something that, um, you know, gets under your skin. And this raises, you know, a more general question is whether emotional AI is an acceptable uh, um, way of, of collecting data and using it. And I think our understanding of people's intent and their emotions through their facial expressions is still very much in its infancy. And so we don't really know whether we're getting what we're getting is accurate. But there's already a variety of um, applications that are being developed um, uh, for the tailoring of ads, as I said, the screening of job interviewees, monitoring of employees, and they can do that from their laptops, seeing how, you know, how distracted they are, how hard they're working and so on. And more recently, there's been a move towards using this technique for identifying mental health symptoms. Um, if someone's about to, you know, become de depressed, are they looking anxious? And the moral question I think that this um, approach raises is, would it be okay if people um, were aware of their facial, how their facial expressions were being analyzed and, and what's being inferred from it? Um, and um, I think, again, it's not a question of it being black or white, but it's something we need to consider through these different contexts. So that's just giving you an overview, I think, of uh, the creepy data uh, that um, the sort of the, the you know the, how it's being reported in the press, but also these new technologies that are being developed, and how we need to think about what the consequences and implications are. And when I want to move on to think about what can be done to protect people from um, invasion of their personal privacy, and clearly there are examples, as we heard, Cambridge Analytica. I don't need to go into any more details. And I think there are four uh, main areas that we should be thinking about. Firstly, uh, governments introducing stricter laws, increasing awareness of what's going on and providing explicit privacy warnings like health warnings we have on cigarette packages. And we see this in the UK and Europe with the GDPR this year, that they are trying to um, you know, make it more difficult or should I say make it stricter and think about the, the person and how to protect them from this type of invasion. Secondly, we can think about developing completely new platforms for the internet that can ring fence uh, personal data. And Tim Berners-Lee, who I understand was at MozFest uh, Fest, sorry, last week, he's got a startup company called Inrupt. And the idea is that you as an individual can create, manage and secure your own personal online data in your, on your laptop. And you can then decide who accesses it and you know, who you can share it with. Another uh, uh, team in the UK is also coming you know, in Cambridge and in London thinking about this in terms of data in a box. So they're coming up with a new uh, framework for this. So this research is going on. Um, we can also expect companies, particularly tech companies, to do more to protect their users and be transparent about their practices and have better controls and checkups. And then we can um, you know, ask researchers or expect researchers to do much more into investigating what's acceptable and find out what people think about others using their data. So for the um, second part of my talk, I just need a bit of some water. Thanks. Um, I'm going to just cover uh, number three and four, which is what can companies do, what are they doing, and then what are we as researchers doing? So I don't know how many of you have looked at uh, what Google and Facebook have been up to, but they've been very active behind the scenes trying to uh, introduce their privacy uh, checkups and, and what they're doing to 
and making it much more accessible. It's no longer like the legalese that used to be for terms and conditions. They're actually writing it so that people can understand. They're using images. They're showing you what you can do to turn off and turn off. And also the explanation why they're collecting data about you. So this is one. There are many on Google's privacy checkup if you want to have a look. Um, and you know, and they, they are trying to both give an explanation and also the easy way for you to turn on and off if you're not comfortable in the way they're collecting data from you, for example, your Chrome history and which sites you've collect, um, visited on the web. Um, I mentioned earlier about Facebook's uh, new uh, home video conferencing device, and this was very much in the news. This is a um, it's not out yet, but this is an image of how it might appear in someone's kitchen. And of course, what you can see is there is a camera and a microphone. And, but there's some AI here, so the camera can follow you as you move around the room. And that can be quite a, you know, a good uh, technology if you want to show what's happening in your kitchen. Um, and so this ability to automatically zoom in and out, I think is, you know, for us as interaction designers is really exciting. But as we heard, that there's the potential or the problem that this uh, device could just start recording a video of you or audio without you realizing this and then use it in some sort of way. Now, Facebook isn't that stupid. Um, and they have been thinking a lot about how to address this issue and have their own um, practice called private by design. And again, similar to Google, they have made it easy for you to disable uh, the cameras and the audio and also to explain how it works. So here you can completely disable the camera and microphone with a single tap or block the camera lens. Facebook doesn't listen to view or keep the contents of your portal video calls. Your portal conversations stay behind between you and the people you're calling and more and more. And so it's really trying to be clear about its policy and also the ability for you as the user to feel um, <coughs> secure but also comfortable with you know, how much you want to reveal when you want to turn your camera on and off and making it easy. And so in a way, it, it's, it's providing um, the user with the ability to enjoy that functionality, that um, new functionality that this new system can provide. By the way, these portals can connect to f four others. So you could have five of them in different locations. Um, and you can imagine how that might be used by families and friends. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not people read these uh, new um, descriptions and they act upon it, or whether the press do their scaremongering and say, you know, look, this is you know outrageous that you can, they may be recording. So um, it's not for me to say, to uh, condone or to uh, celebrate what these tech companies are doing, but I just think we should be made aware that they are being quite serious about coming up with ways to counteract um, and to, uh, you know, consider uh, uh, the invasion of, of personal um, data. What I want to do for the last part of my talk is to talk about some of the research that we've been doing, which is, is the second part, which is to think about if you open up data, what could you do with it? And in particular, can you empower communities and the general public to be interested, to be curious about it? And if so, how do we do this? Um, and so I'm going to talk about three um, studies that I've done over the years, uh, which is to think about, you know, um, understanding are people comfortable about revealing data about themselves, but also being able to interact with it. The first one is um, a study we did a few years ago, which was to um, confront people about what they really think by setting up a hoax situation. And this is called the quantified toilet study. And I'll come into that in a minute. The second one is about showing people different perspectives um, about the impact of a new technology that's, that can deal with sensitive issues before it's been developed, and to try and get people's different opinions um, using what we call the contravision method. And then the third one um, is if we open up <coughs> data, which is normally considered to be slightly creepy, in this case, tracking people where they go, and let the public see where they go and what they think of that. Will it become more acceptable? Will, it, will they be interested in it? And could they contribute to, you know, helping you know use that data in interesting ways? And that's going to be the Madeira Tourism Project. So the first uh, study we did 
involve doing mild deception. Though any of you who have filled in your ethics forms will know that it's possible to do mild deception, whereby um, you set up a situation that isn't true um, to question people as to imagining what it would be like. And you're disrupting an, a, a, an accepted state of affairs um, by setting up this hoax. And I'll describe in a minute how uh, my researchers did that. But the purpose of this is to observe people's reactions when they come across it. Do they become upset, surprised, outraged, or do they not mind? Do they question the reality of the situation? Do they tell others about it? And what else do they do? And the reason for doing this, rather than just you know, asking them in an interview or a questionnaire, is it's, it's there in the moment, so you get their immediate reaction um, and response rather than one that's measured and, and um, they've, they've thought about. So what did uh, my researchers do? Well, a few years ago, they were at a workshop on Internet of Things, and they were really interested in how a community would react to having their personal data analyzed and used in a public place. And they wanted to spark um, a public debate on future of surveillance technologies. And so what they did was they set up this fake service, which was they were a fictitious company called <coughs> Quantified Toilets, and they had installed a urine analysis technology in the public toilets in this conference center to improve the public health of that um, community. And they wanted to know how would people react knowing that their urine was being analyzed and made public. So what did they do? As I said, this was um, mild deception. They placed these signs in every toilet at the convention center in Toronto. And these signs say, this facility is proud to participate in the Healthy Building Initiative. Behavior at these toilets is being recorded for analysis and it's to help monitor public health. So these were put on, on the mirrors and in the toilets, both um, all of the toilets on, on all of the floors. And then they, they created a fake website which showed uh, the results of this analysis. And this website's still there, if you want to have a look. And it shows uh, the, the time, the, the ID of the toilet, the sex of the person who was um, in that toilet, what they deposited, the odor, the blood alcohol level, whether there were drugs detected, whether they were pregnant, or whether there were any infections. To add authenticity, they provide this table on the website, and it showed uh, you know, what were the benefits of having this quantified toilet approach versus traditional um, approach. And you can see that it's unobtrusive, it um, provides constant analysis and community health statistics. So um, what happened? Well, within an hour, it went viral. There were many, many tweets, retweets and blogs. Uh, the people working in the convention center were asked to come along and, and check what was going on and take down the stickers. There was much discussion about uh, all of the people there, but there was also much discussion online. So it, created, it did exactly what was hoped, have a debate about um, data tracking. Um, some people felt duped. They really thought it was true. Uh, the press gave it enormous coverage. So, for example, The Atlantic um, wrote a, had a big article about what a toilet hoax can tell us about the future of surveillance. So it got people really, in, you know, talking. But not only that, we got a very wide set of responses. And this is just um, analysis of some of these um, from passers-by and those who are online. There was, as you might expect, disapproval. Health advice, it does not get any creepier. Then there was concern. Imagine your employer could find out how hard you'd partied last night. <laughs> then there was resignation. I'm sure the government's been doing this for years. <laughs> then there was voyeurism. I just spent the last 10 minutes watching the PP logs. Can't stop watching them. <laughs> then there was humor. Some people just stood outside the toilet and they tried to match people entering and exiting the toilets with some of the data that was appearing on the website. So you can see that it's not, you know, the reaction might be for many uh, disgust or outrage, but actually there's a lot more responses that you might get from something like this. And remember, this was all anonymous. It wasn't, you know, naming someone. Um, 
Um, so I think as an early uh, attempt at trying to get people's reactions, it was very effective at uh, opening up the debate about surveillance. And I think that's what we need to do is not to always think it's black or white. It's, yeah, we should definitely stop this. We should never have this. This is something that can happen. And it might be something that's already happening in Japan in certain places. And the question is, is are people prepared to um, accept this if it, if it has something for the common good? The second um, approach or study I want to uh, describe is what we, um, is called the Contravision. And this was um, a project we did uh, when we were looking at mobile privacy um, uh, a few years ago now. And we were very interested again about um, future technology and, and how that might affect people's privacy. And we, again, we didn't want to just ask people what they thought. We wanted to elicit a range of reactions, their values and attitudes for a hypothetical um, invasive healthcare system. And again, this healthcare system was you know, one that we conjured up that it could collect all sorts of personal data about you and send it to your doctor. And the, the particular area that we wanted to tackle was um, the difficult challenge of food addiction. For people who just can't stop eating, they've tried every diet, but they just carry on eating, how might our new system be able to help them? And the method uses both positive and negative videos of the same scenario to enable people to see different points of view. So this was the fictitious technology um, that we came up with called Dietmon. And it was meant to be a wearable diet monitoring system that you could use 24-7. And as I said, it was meant for people who've got serious problems and who've tried everything else, but that has failed. And the components of this fictitious system were a pair of glasses that had a camera in. This was before uh, Google Glass. And it could take, if I stared at that for three seconds, um, it would be able to uh, take a picture. This would then be analyzed, and then it would send to your phone the calorific, how many calories there are in that. Not only that, um, uh, the system um, has a chip that can be embedded into um, a user, and, then, and their physiological responses to eating could then be sent back to their doctor so they could see any changes in their sugar level, sugar level and, and so on. So this, the idea here was to have a, a system that could help people by giving them constant feedback um, about what was happening and whether they were over their targets. So I'm going to let you watch a video now that, to explain how it works. Basically, you will look at a plate of food for three seconds, yeah. and it will take a photograph yeah. of the food, and then send that through to a central database that will analyse the calorie content and then send you... Narrative media, in particular video, have been a powerful tool for triggering user reactions, future interfaces and technologies. Future concept videos are one way of immersing the viewer in a technology that does not yet exist. Apple's Knowledge Navigator from 1987 is an early example. Microsoft's future healthcare videos are more recent examples of high production value day in the lifestyle videos designed to give the viewer a sense of how the technology will affect their life. These concept videos all show a very positive view of the technology, and we're concerned that a utopian-only perspective limits user reactions, particularly with respect to concerns such as privacy. Our methodology, called Contravision, involves creating both a positive and negative version of each scene in a story. Here is one scene from our example videos. Uh, no, sorry, Simon, you're going to have to cut that down a bit. I can't eat that size. Okay. Hold on. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's, yeah. Take that away. Okay. Let's have another look. Note the protagonist's enthusiasm regarding the technology. Yeah, that'll do. That's great. Thank you very much. Back up a little bit. I just need to know what's going on here. I've got, well, I've got this gadget that my doctor's given me because I'm trying to lose weight. Huh. And these glasses. I've got cameras in, so when you look at something, well, try them on. Try the... Put them on. Have a look at that cake there. Mm -hmm. Right, just look at it for three seconds. Yeah. Okay. Oh, look at that. That's approximately the number of calories in that cake. That's it's fantastic, wild. isn't it? So the, the cameras record the image and then cross-reference with a database, and they, they do an approximate uh, estimation of the calorific content. Plus, I've got this other thing, which is a little microchip in my wrist. And it monitors Here is the same scene from the negative version of the story. Sorry. Yes, I will. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just going to have to take this. I'll, no, I'll see you in a sec. Yeah.
Notice how the protagonist hides his use of the technology. The other negative scenes show a similar bias. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> you scoffed that down quite quickly. What you scared the cake police might get you. No, no, no. <laughs> Using a contravision approach may help researchers gather a wider spectrum of user responses to future technologies. Okay, sorry a bit about the quality of that video, but I hope you got the message that what we were trying to do was to present the same scenario, but from a positive and a negative perspective, in order to get people to have a wider uh, set of um, you know possibilities to think about this technology. So that was just one. We made um, uh, six um, different videos, short videos uh, for different scenes. One was uh, meeting the doctor, another was having breakfast uh, with the, the family, another one was at the work for this birthday party, another was going past a, a, a cake shop and then having dinner with colleagues um, and, and an ap aperitif at a bar where there's lots of peanuts and crisps. And what we found, well, just to uh, reiterate, the main difference between the videos is that in the positive, the protagonist embraces the technology. They're very open and enthusiastic. They're proactive and see how effective it is. And they negotiate obstacles that get in the way and ultimately succeeds with this. In the negative uh, video, the protagonist is reluctant to try it. They're very deceptive and secretive about what they're doing. They're passive and ineffectual and they're defeated by obstacles and then ultimately fail. So even though they're the same scenario, you get very different ways in which uh, the protagonist and the people around them uh, respond. So we carried out a number of focus groups um, and uh, interviews for people who watched these videos, both the positive and negative. And what we found was that there was a wide range of responses uh, in both conditions. And here's some examples of, uh, or some quotes. For, for the positive, someone said, it's not natural. He's too open, not normal. I wouldn't expose myself too much. I would make me look bad. But it was from the negative, it was in, someone was saying it encourages deception. It's better to be open to lower the level of stress with his deception. He alienates others. Um, and then more reactions that it's too interfering, it's recording to too much. Hello? I don't know where that comes from. There's someone. <laughs> yes, it does work. Um, it's too distracting or it's invading privacy. Um, and um, there, you know, so you get a range of different reactions. Um, so for the invading privacy, I wouldn't want others to see what I eat if I had a problem with weight and so on. So um, this approach, which we've called Contravision, I think provides an alternative way of examining attitudes, values, and concerns for a future technology that could be very sensitive, but ultimately could have many benefits for people in society. But before we you know, launch this, and perhaps Google might have benefited doing something like this with Google Glass, where, you know, getting seen whether people are accepting or they're horrified or they find it creepy. And I think it, what it does is it exposes people to different perspectives, and that can lead to more informed opinions about sensitive issues, particularly on the personal use of new technology, also whether external support um, is there to solve an uncomfortable problem, and whether there's a level of openness or deception um, that will be um, you know, facilitated or, or happen, and then what's the impact on others' reactions to this. Okay, so the, the last uh, part of my talk is, going, is talking more about why don't we try and open up more data to the public and empower them, so very much a bottom-up approach. There's been so much discussion about big data from top-down, about what companies are doing with this and the creepy data agenda, but I'm thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if some of us had access to more data about our personal data, our health data, the environmental data, um, so that we know more about what's going on in the world and in our communities. But how do we do this um, and what might be the benefits? And um, one approach at the Open Inst Data Institute, which is based in London, uh, opened a few years ago, was to think we need to increase people's awareness, first of all, of how to be ethical when doing this. So it's one thing just to say, here, here's all the data about um, uh, your your health or your um 
your heart rate for the last 10 years. But what would you do with it? Would it make you anxious or neurotic? How do we make sure that um, when we give data to people, um, it's done in the appropriate way? And so what they've done at the Open Data Institute is to provide tools and guidelines to companies, to organizations, to think about when they're making data open, how best to do this. And they provided this um, data ethics canvas, and you probably can't read here, but there are lots of questions that you should ask when, when making data available. And you can, you can just see here, I've uh, blown up uh, a couple of them here, which is engaging with people. Um, how can people engage with you? Can people affected appeal or request changes to the service? To what extent? So there are lots and lots of questions that they're proposing that you go through. And it would be, I don't know how many people are using this, but I think it's going in the right direction to give companies who want to make their data open a set of questions um, to go through to feel reassured that they're at least you know, making an effort to think of uh, what people themselves might think of. But what else can researchers do? Um, and this is the last case study I'm going to uh, talk about, which is um, how do we explore how and when to reveal data to the general public? Um, what's being collected about them, their local environment, and where they go. Does it, is it, does it trigger um, curiosity, or does it you know, trigger mi mistrust? And also, why, where, and what is this data being used for? Why are you making it open? Why are you collecting this data? And lastly, I want to talk about some research that it's currently doing, um, which is, can we make, um, can we investigate where the data can democratize society? Can society benefit and learn more about how to put it to good use? And that's what I'll finish with. So this is a project that we conducted a, a couple of years ago, which was um, helping um, uh, the tourist board of Madeira to understand better the impact of tourism, um, particularly the economic and ecological, on the small island of Madeira. How many of you have been to Madeira? A few of you, so you know how beautiful it is. And you know, also know that the number of uh, cruise ships that come in, there are about three or four a day, and thousands of tourists just come off the cruise ship and they go off to, onto the island, do a few things and then come back. And effectively, there's over one million tourists that visit this island per annum. And um, there's a population of only 250,000 people. And so the, obviously the tourist um, board and uh, people on the island are worried about how it's affecting the resources and the wildlife. And so they, they wanted to have a better picture of where do the tourists go and how many. And what they installed was a Wi-Fi sensing infrastructure that can measure the tourists coming from the airport and, and um, off the cruise ships to, to the port and seeing where they went and how many and what times. And the way in which they did this was to count the number of Wi-Fi enabled devices in a given location. So your smartphone, if it's got Wi-Fi capability, it could detect the unique identifier from those phones that have the Wi-Fi switched on and then they could, at a given time, estimate how many people are there. The data was collected was anonymous. Um, they could, of course, did, you know, using various um, forms of analysis of who's come off the ship or what planes have detected who they were, but they didn't. They just wanted to get the numbers, of course, and then the numbers were converted into tourist flows. So here's an example of a tourist flow that was that um, made um, from this data collection. And you can see peaks and troughs at different times. And what it's showing you is, is exactly that, peaks and troughs of people that um, are at this place on the island. But why are there peaks? What's behind them? You know, why are suddenly there are a lot of people here? And that's what's really interesting is one thing to have numbers and graphs, and it's another to be able to understand what's behind it. And that's where I think the tourist board, you know, they, they were fine getting this data, but it didn't really help them. To, and so that's where we were asked to come in and help think about how we could enrich this data. And so we started asking questions and talking to the tourist board. Would the general public, passers-by, be interested in understanding how tourism is impacting Madeira, would they provide more information than just numbers about themselves and their surroundings? For example, what can they see around? Are there families? Um, are there young people? Are there people with moustaches? How many people have got glasses? Whatever questions, you know, just to get them to, um, I was being a bit um, 
silly there, but I'm just saying that you can ask many questions for them to, to look around. But more seriously, um, could they provide explanations of what is behind the data peaks and troughs? So what we did, um, we've been involved in designing a series of physical installations in my lab um, to attract people, passers-by, to answer questions. And this one we developed, which we called Romeo, it's a physical public kiosk. The idea was that it would move around, but we didn't have this technology to, to let it move around. It kept falling over, so it was more stationary. But it was to attract passers-by to answer questions. So it's got a very friendly interface. It had a bow tie and some eyes just to make it appear friendly. It wasn't meant to be anthropomorphized. anthropomorphized. It was meant to just be attractive. And our passers-by are asked questions about themselves, the collected data flow visualizations you saw, and the surroundings. And they can answer simply by using yes, no buttons. You can see the white buttons. Or there's a keypad for open-ended answers. So the questions asked, we spent a lot of time with the tourist world thinking about the questions that we might ask, how many. So we asked questions about, um, as I said, context. Describe the people around you. Um, and then what's the current mood here? Do you think people are happy? Is there a good vibe? What's the average age around here? Um, does this place feel busy to you? So things that you can never get from numbers, but might be really interesting and important to, to know about uh, what's happening in a place. Um, contextual questions, do you come here often? What nationality are you? How often have you been into Madeira? Why are you here? So many questions that are quite personal. Um, and then the ones about data. Why does this airport get busier from May onwards? Why are there more people at the port? Why is it busier at lunchtime? And so on and so forth. And then some factual questions, general knowledge, which people seem to love trying to answer. How many people use the airport on an average day? From what country do most tourists come from? Uh, which is the wettest month? And so on. So what we did was we mixed these up. <clears throat> people could come up, just answer any, any number of questions and walk away. It would then reset itself. Um, and so someone else could come up. What happened? We placed this in different locations on the island, and um, there was much intrigue and use by all, all manner of people. We had individuals, we had pairs, we had groups and families, and then people came back with others to show them this. And during the first deployment, over 500 people um, answered the questions. Over 1,000 questions were answered. Because it's in Portugal, we had the option of doing Portuguese or English. And so there, some, a, a good percentage were Portuguese. Most of them were yes, no answers, but some people gave um, uh, free form answers. And there was much discussion from the groups around about uh, what, why were these questions being asked? What was, you know, what was the data? Uh, that they were being shown. But they were highly engaged. So um, the majority of people spent um, between one minute and five minutes interacting with it. Others would be waiting for their go. We only had one of these built at the time. And then they would come along and use it. And so, and then there were quite a few people who used it for over five minutes. And we didn't coerce them. We weren't there to say, hey, come and try our amazing technology, give us answers. It just stood there at the airport and in the tourist board and at the port. The data that we presented was fairly simple. We just wanted to see whether people would be prepared to um, see if they could answer the question. So why is the central part of Funchal so busy at 10 o'clock? And the answer is bolo de caco. Any of you have been there? There's the most amazing Portuguese bread. It's, it's delicious. And people queue up for that. So that was the explanation. Why are there more people at the airport on Mondays? A lot of people selected more incoming tourists or business flights. But 5% suggested other reasons, which were really quite interesting, as was why does it get busier in this area from May onwards? So most people said because there were more events or there are more tourists, but there were others, nearly 20% suggested other reasons. So what did our study reveal? Um, I think firstly that this kind of device, rather than uh, walking up to someone saying, can you answer a few questions or can you go online to a website, it attracted many people. They were very curious about it. And then once they started answering the questions, they didn't stop. They, they really enjoyed answering those questions. And it was a diversity of people. So it was tourists, it was local, it was people from all over the world, um, and it was families and young kids. Um, and um, 
a lot of them had a go at explaining those people flow visualizations. And we were interested to see whether if we gave them the data, what did they think of it? But the data was a week old because we could only get that data. We couldn't have the real data that, there. And so it was limited in what they knew as to how they could interpret it. But it was promising for us to think you can give data to people and not just ask the experts, the tourists or the scientists to analyze it, but to let others. And I think for the tourist board, they obtained a richer picture of what was going on in the island. And more importantly, they started to ask different questions um, about what tourists do rather than, you know, which countries do they come from? And so I think for us, it was um, an attempt to combine automatic data tracking or monitoring, which was this Wi-Fi uh, hotspot analysis, with a more acceptable approach to collecting data from the public about the public. So um, I think we're just coming to the end. So I've got five minutes. I just want to finish off with some current research that we're doing which is working with Great Ormond Street Hospital's new living lab, which is called DRIVE, for exploring health data. And this was launched a couple of weeks ago, and there's a lot of excitement. Those of you who don't know, Great Ormond Street Hospital is for children who are very sick. It's a very well-known hospital in London, and they're very much at the forefront of new technology, trying to harness this new technology from VR to artificial intelligence to data science, to somehow think of how can they transform clinical practice and enhance patient experience. And this living lab is a very large space opposite Russell Square, and it's been designed to be a safe place to try out new technologies um, and ways of looking at the data so that uh, members of the public, clinicians um, and students can come along and try it out before trying to put it into the hospital uh, in, in, you know, and, and see whether it's effective rather than it being too late and spending lots of money and it not being um, doing much or doing detrimental um, work. So um, part of what we're doing, there are many exciting projects that are going on there, uh, but uh, within UCLIC, we're looking at how we can visualize clinical data to make it usable, useful, and actionable. And the hospitals can now collect lots of data about patients. Yeah, for example, cardiovascular data, um, for different kinds of operations, how much blood is being used for, not, for a particular operation, um, how many patients have been through, the difference between um, uh, the success rates of different kinds of operations and so on. And this data used to be ephemeral, but now they can store it and they can do things with it. And we're interested in, in what you might do with all of this data for clinicians who are very busy. And in particular, we're interested in how we could you know, use this data to democratize existing um, practices. And we're looking at how we can design new interfaces to support more equitable participation. So typically you'll get a data scientist, they'll have the data, they'll be poring over it, and then they might report back on that data to, to the clinicians. Or there might be just one clinician who spent some time learning how to use these data science um, uh, tools. And so what it tends to do is it, it biases towards supporting one person, usually an expert, to control, um, uh, in control, to steer the analysis and interpret the data. What we're trying to do is, is to move away from that model to one where it's more level playing field, where there are a num you know, opportunities for who's around that data to um, um, interact and understand it. So we're designing a new multimodal interface. We're combining speech input. We're using... Uh, um, the Eli Eliza, um, <laughs> Alexa, <laughs> bit of a Freudian slip there. <laughs> the Alexa uh, Analytics API, uh, and we're combining that with visual uh, data so that you can talk to the visualization and break it down and add to it. And so that anyone can ask questions of the data and thinking about uh, by doing that, by talking rather than just simply pressing buttons on and off or filters on and off, does that encourage a new way? Does that encourage people to externalize and think through new questions? And also to get people to, in a group, to talk more about the data. We don't know, we're just starting to work on this. And we really want to facilitate new ways of thinking about clinical practices. Typically in a hospital, it's very hierarchical as to who gets to say what. If we could change that, 
from. If you look on the left, that's typically how you might get your data science experts working on some data towards something like this. This is Apple Design Studio. I couldn't find the, an, an image, um, but I just borrowed that because I think it captures what we're trying to do, which is to allow everyone to be able to have a say and to collaborate. And we think that if you can design new interfaces to support this kind of collaboration, you'll get, um, you'll be able to open up the data and allow more people to have a say about what they think about this data and what they can do with it. So on that note, I'm just going to summarize and then open the floor to some questions, which is at the beginning of my talk, I said that creepy data collections on the rise and gave you some examples. And I think it raises some important privacy issues, but also some questions, moral questions that we as a community need to address more, which is, should we just be thinking about restricting monitoring and requiring people's consent for any data? Or if the reasons for collecting personal data are made more public, will people be more accepting and they'll think that's okay? And then lastly, I talked about how we can you know, carry out research that can help discover what's acceptable to people, what their opinions are when they're put on the spot. And lastly, this is something that's very close to my heart, which is how can we open up data so that it can be democratizing and empowering to communities and society at large, rather than always providing experts with new tools to, to analyze that data. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, you gave us lots and lots of food for thought. And, um, now we're just going to open it up for questions. There's still a chance to get your questions in on Twitter. That's hashtag Mozilla Speakers and on Slack, which is our speaker series channel. Um, and Diane, I think, will be taking questions from some of the other officers. Um, we're going to uh, start with a question that's come in, and that's uh, it, it's a bit of a meaty one. But should privacy advocates target the point of collection, uh, the point of data processing, or the point of action stemming from that? that processing? Um, I think uh, the easy answer is to say all of them, um, but it depends on the context. I think we need to, you know, what does it mean to be a data activist? Um, and, you know, w for what context? Is it about health data? Is it about um, data that's been collected about, you know, the emotional AI data? And I think each of these contexts, it could be different as to whether you should be focusing on the data collection or how it's being used. So um, I don't think it, again, I think it's, there isn't a black or white answer. I think some activists may be thinking we should do it for all, but it could be that at certain points it's more important than others. Great, thank you very much. Sarah, do you? Um, no more online, maybe anything from the floor here? Oh, yep. We have one at the back. All right. Mark. 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 Throw the buck. And just speak right in. <laughs> so right, right, you uh, talked a bit about um, giving users more uh, information on what their data is going to be used for. Um, do you think that most users understand the implications of the data that they share uh, to the extent that they can make informed choices about whether or not to share those data? Um, I think that's a really important point. Um, and uh, it I think in certain contexts, yes. Um, I'm fudging it here because I don't think it's an easy yes, no. I think people, if they, if awareness has been increased, if they receive uh, or they understand or they know what the data is and where it's going, um, I think yes. I think we shouldn't uh, uh, you know, consider that people may not understand. I think it's a matter of education and, and increasing awareness. I think, which is what we're trying to do, is to give people the opportunity themselves to interrogate and explore data which they previously haven't had the opportunity to. And we're trying to design interfaces that are natural to them for, to, to do that. Um, so um, I would err on saying that if you uh, provide people with you know, good enough explanations and you're able to explain it to them, they should understand it. Hi. So uh, my question is, oh, okay. 
Uh, I go every day, day through Camden to go to the university, and as you know, it's a very busy tourist area. And every day I see people taking pictures for Instagram, and I know I sometimes end up on some of those pictures. <laughs> so I was thinking, like, is this kind of a privacy issue? Is it like on a personal? Should it be dealt on a personal base or on a company base? Does it make you feel uncomfortable, or do you not mind? I don't mind. I'm just like interested in knowing. Like I, I don't mind being on a picture. I'm just interested in knowing how to deal with that. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's in a public place, and I don't mind that you know people are taking uh, pictures. If I'm sitting on a train or something, and someone points a camera at me, I feel uncomfortable. Why they're doing that? Because it's being directed at me. If you are just happen to be walking past when someone's taking a picture of someone else, I think that's incidental. And I think, you know, sometimes we maybe get a little precious about our faces. It depends what it's being used for. So, I, you know, if I find that I'm on someone's Instagram uh, feed and I'm looking okay, that's fine. If I'm looking terrible, that's a different matter. So. <laughs> Thank you. We actually have a, um, a question from Mountain View. Hi, Yvonne. It's Joe Fish here. Um, first oh, hi, off, Joe. First off, thank you very much for coming. It's lovely to see this. Um, I wanted to ask a very specific question about uh, some of the cross-cultural implications of the stuff that you've been talking about. Um, on one hand, uh, in the US, uh, we, from the point of view of, of, of Europe and the UK, um, there is no GDPR, right? There is no data protection. On the other hand, I mean, and, and the last question I think nicely pulls this out, the number of security cameras and CCTV cameras that you walk across in London is far, far greater. I mean, I, I think I may actually come from home to work without passing a single camera, right? Like, and that's probably not possible anywhere in the UK. Um, I exaggerate. Um, I've been wanting to write a paper for years about this. Um, it's a paper which doesn't actually work in print in that I want to call it privacy or privacy, a cross-cultural analysis. Um, and of course, it doesn't work when you write it down. Um, but I wanted to ask about that particular question, right? What are, the, what are the cultural associations with these notions of data privacy and how do those change? And how do you address that in the work that you're proposing to do? That's a really good point, and good to see you up so early in the morning. Um, I think it's there is difference. I think you know when CCTV cameras arrived in the UK, people were up in arms, and now, ten years on, they just accept it. Um, uh, whereas in Germany, for example, uh, a, a store introduced cameras um, in in uh, one of the um, just above. Uh, one of the um, screens that was used to advertise a particular product. And when, and then it could then detect what someone, you know, the dwell time and how long they were looking at particular products. They were up in arms, the, the, uh, many of the people in Germany. And so as a result of that, the, the, the German um, grocery store had to take them down. That would never, um, probably never happen in the UK. Um, so I think there are big differences, and it depends on the, the culture, you're right, as to what's considered acceptable. Germany, uh, people are very uh, uh, concerned about where their data is going. And I suspect it would be good to see, you know, across different cultures and why that's the case. Is it changing, um, you know, depending on how old you are um, um, and... Um, and why that is. So I think it would be great for you to write that paper. Maybe it's one that could speak if you had a text. Um, but thanks for that. Thank you. Great. Uh, we're going to have to um, shut down for uh, uh, the, the broadcast. So we'll, we'll say goodbye to our colleagues who are joining us over at Mozilla. But uh, we're going to continue taking questions here in the office. So uh, thanks for coming. And um, yeah, any more questions from the room? Stay <laughs> down, everybody. <laughs> so um, you talked a lot about consent, but I think there's some scenarios in which the idea of like individual consent is insufficient. So, like obvious examples would be like if I decide to upload all my like contacts to Facebook, then maybe that affects those people, and we like often see this. Uh, for like genetic data where maybe you know people related to you are uploading data it implies data about you uh, so do you have 
any sort of suggestions about how we can think about uh, you know the, the things you've been talking about in, in these scenarios where it's not really about one individual understanding the impact but actually about the impact being on like a wide group of people and that's a really hard question as to how you know I wish I could answer it on the top of my head like that but it, you know so uploading I mean I think it's the question asked earlier about walking you know in Camden and taking photos, uploading them, all these other people might be involved, but then someone might be doing it to uh, specifically about a data set which is about themselves but others. So, for example, the things we're doing um, in Great Ormond Street Hospital, we might be able to have all the data about uh, people who've got a particular disease and the operations that were conducted on them, and it might be that some people object to that, even though it's anonymized, they might think, well, that's my personal data. My son or daughter had the operation and died, and I don't really want to be participating in this. And so I think, you know, we don't know. Um, I think this living lab is an opportunity to get a much wider range of people's views and opinions, because all too often you'll just do a survey, uh, or and there's only a small number of people who, who will respond. And so that's part of what we're trying to do is to see whether, you know, you, you give the negative or the positive or you give the whole range of things that might happen and see whether people think that's not acceptable, that is acceptable. So I think our methodology could be used where, you know, you can start to aggregate data or it's a collective data and it could affect certain people. So that's a, good, a very good question.